Right, good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Chen Jidun, head of the JSC, Jeffrey Sachs Center. Um, and with me today, we have a distinguished group of uh, experts on the question of um, the value of soil fertility to the general bio state of biodiversity in ASEAN, as well as the world in general. Uh, before I begin, just a few reminders about um, the way that we're going to carry out the, um, the, the panel's discussion or the workshop. The first thing is that we, I will uh, be introducing each of the speakers and each of them will have about 12 minutes to uh, go through their uh, presentation, after which um, we will have a Q&A session after every one of the speakers are done. Um, so, firstly, without uh, further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Dr. Um, Luli Meling uh, from the Sarawak Tropical Peat Research Institute of Malaysia. Um, the title of her talk would be The Dilemma of Tropical Peatlands in Southeast Asia, uh, something she has worked on for many years. Um, I would like to invite her on the stage now to go through her uh, presentation with us. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Meling. Morning, everybody. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you to the organizer for this invitation. Yeah, but uh, I was not. W I was wondering whether it was a smart of me to put the title "the dilemma," but actually, the pit is really a dilemma at times. It's a gold mine, but it's also a time bomb. So today, I will speak about the pressing issue of uh, tropical peatland in Southeast Asia and uh, their complex dilemma. Then I would also like to finish with some brief words about how uh, I think we in ASEAN should move forward on our tropical peatland. Now, uh, tropical peatland in uh, Southeast Asia are unique ecosystems paramount to uh, biodiversity conservation, carbon sequestration, and the provision of essential ecosystem services. However, they are confronted with uh, formidable challenges, including land conversion, unsustainable agricultural practices, and the impacts of climate change. So at the same time, it has always been a Cinderella, uh, the tropical thing. The same thing as the as the researcher is also has always been uh, looked uh, or treated like a Cinderella too. So as a soil scientist, I emphasize the agency of understanding and addressing this dilemma to ensure sustainable land management and the preservation of these invaluable ecosystems. As you may be aware, tropical peatland are integral to Southeast Asia, diverse range of ecosystems. While they are globally distributed, their most significant extent is in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly Russia and Canada. Now, these ecosystems offer a wide range of uh, services, including water supply and water quality regulation, climate regulation and support for diversity. So it is very important to realize that uh, a lot of times we have been compared based on the understanding of uh, temperate uh, peatland, but there are a lot of things that we ourselves should do our own backyard study to make sure that we don't let people tell you what you should do with your backyard. So additionally, the tropical peatland uh, contribute to provisioning services such as food, uh, fuel production, However, it is within these services that the dilemma arises. So it is a very sexy uh, subject whereby uh, it is very interesting and uh, it can be very exciting, but it also can be a real uh, challenge. So the global significance of peatland lies in the exceptional carbon storage capacity. They are among the most effective terrestrial ecosystems for carbon sequestration. So as you can see here, you can see above, above ground and below ground, they are all carbon. But the, red, the thing is that we need to understand uh, what is the extent of this carbon. So over thousands of years, these uh, waterlogged, organic rich accumulate and vast amount of carbon. So studies have estimated that tropical peatland stored between 69 to 175 metric tons of carbon per hectare, representing it as one of the highest uh, carbon pool. So it is important to note that these values can vary depending on site specific uh, or the site characteristics, okay? So disturbed uh, 
degraded peatland resulting from land use change and drainage have lower carbon storage capacity leading to carbon loss. In their natural state, peatlands have a net cooling effect on the climate. Furthermore, the destruction of intact peatland ecosystems results in the loss of critical habitats for the diverse flora and fauna, including endangered species. It is worth mentioning that tropical peatland forests have not received as much research extension as some lowland dryland forests, and we are still discovering new species within them. This diversity extends to the uh, net habitat diversity with various forest types found on peatland across the tropics, from South America and Central America to the Congo Basin and Southeast Asia. But we need to be very careful because a lot of times people think that anything that is wet is peatland or anything that looks organic is peatland, but there is still a difference between organic soil and peat soil. So even if I look at some of the videos, because we can't afford to go to some of these areas all over the world, like in South America, yeah, there are issues on this. So the dilemma of this tropical peatland intensifies to various environmental pressure, the drainage, the uh, climate change, the unsustainable agricultural practices. Now, it is important to acknowledge that drainage and mechanical compaction is very important. So there is a difference between managed and unmanaged peat. And this can be seen on the hotspot of 2015 and 2019, whereby in Sarawak, we were successful in doing the acro environmental management for the area. Now, the emissions from peatlands uh, also you can see on the net warming effect. As you can see how it is focused both in Europe and in uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, how are we going to handle this dilemma? You know, So we have to remember that about 50% of the temperate peatland have been drained for 200 to 300 years. And now they come for us for in South Asia, East Asia, it has only been used for less than 50 years, but more than 70% have been deforested. Now, the tropical peatland production, uh, we can see that it's most focused uh, in uh, areas where it has been drained. So, but this includes the methane for the rice. This was a measurement done by uh, Kim Carlson in 2016. Emission concentrate in Asia with the high production. But please be kindly reminded that this also tallies with our population. Now, what is the agriculture and forestry in peatland? Important to the livelihood of local and regional economies. Oil palm on peat provides estimated of 5 million jobs. Now, oil palm is an important revenue source for eradication of poverty and addresses food security uh, concern. We cannot deny this, but as we acknowledge this, we should not abuse it. You know? We should see how we should go forward, how we should in include in the productivity area, how we should strengthen the governmental collaboration, conservation and rehabilitation, emission mitigation, research collaboration, and at the end of the day, please, before we talk all these things, where is the finance part, the money part, you know? So these are the things that we all need to consider and uh, about how we need to keep this peat carbon storage, maintain ongoing carbon sequestration, protect the biodiversity, prevent peatland fire and protect our peatland services. Of course, there are challenges as we say what we want, but there are still not enough studies to say what are the three species that can be put there, how we are going to do it, so these are the things, please, uh, there are a lot of also work that has been done by ASEAN on prevention. There are reports, a couple of reports, by why was there still uh, pit fire? Please do not use just textbook, you know. Please go down to the ground. Please do the measurement, you know. Please don't imagine. Please don't assume. Please verify. So these are the challenges that we have. We are doing a small plot. And now when we do a landscape scale, you have problem. So please don't waste the time. We know, please optimize your resources, optimize the, uh, the work, the fun that we do so that we can do a better work. There is a need to balance between livelihood and climate security. We must have a precise system of water management, best management practices, because this will help to reduce the emission, land subsidence, and peatland fire. So we have to make sure that we understand what we are facing. We don't just say alternate crop. We don't make it so sound so fashionable, but yet it's not practical, yet it's not being executed. So it is very important to have research collaboration to jumpstart, uh, to jumpstart on what we need to do to understand it better so that we can 
uh, make sure that we are able to make, uh, improve whatever that is going on now. So at the end of the day, what is the money? Do we have that money? Now, where is the money? You know? So, I mean, it's always very nice to say what we want, but are we having that money? Are, are it being channeled properly? For example, in 2015, after the fire in Indonesia, you know what happened? Yet you have fire in 2019? Why? People were busy doing business, you know? It was more promoting of the, of the technology, uh, what they want to sell, not about solving the problem. So this is the issue that we are having in Southeast Asia. So it is very important that we reduce this uh, carbon emission by peatland, reduce the loss, because there is no planet B. So we have to make sure that we don't make mistakes, we don't regret that when we retire, before we enter our graveyard, we can still smile, we have left a legacy to make sure that we have something to live uh, for the future generation and that we have uh, something that they can continue with it, with the building blocks that we have started to build. That's all. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Melling. Um, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Arena Shuko. Um, so she is a senior lecturer at University Putra, Malaysia, and she'll be speaking on soil fertility management in Southeast Asia. Uh, may I invite Dr. Suko on the stage? Okay. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. So today, um, I would like to share with you about the soil fertility management. So in terms of now, what we are standing beneath our feet is a, the hidden half, right? The hidden half of things that we could not see, but yet we are still leaving it on, on, on ground. So it's very tricky, and there's a lot of things for improvement for us to look at the parts of soil, particularly soil fertility. Okay? And we need to be able to uh, manage it wisely, okay? so that we can produce crops effectively at an optimum cost and yield. Okay? So when we talk about soil, okay, soil fertility, it deals with nutrients, okay? And nutrients are divided into two, uh, macronutrients and micronutrients. So most of the time, people will always focus on macronutrients because they are the essential parts of uh, growing plants, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But in terms of micronutrients, always have been underestimated most of the time, okay? So uh, let me bring into this periodic table of, of elements, right? So when I uh, show this periodic table to the class, okay, they will be like, oh no, right? This is something heavy for them to digest, right? All of us have been uh, looking at this periodic table for years in school, right? During our chemistry classes. But this table is really crucial for people dealing with soils and of course nutrient management and fertilizers. Because why? Um, as in soils, right, we need to do soil testing to know the soil health status. Similarly, like every year we went for a me yearly medical checkup, right? We need to go and check out what will be our blood pressure, glucose level and stuff. So similar like the soils, uh, we need to treat it wisely as well. So when you do um, soil check, right, soil test, uh, there are nutrients that you will be able to analyze and look at the status of the soil. Um, nutrients, whether it's um, uh, under fertilized, whether it's inadequate nutrients, or whether it's excess. Okay, you want something to be adequate so that it will be uh, utilized wisely, have a better nutrient use efficiency, and you don't uh, simply like fertilize so that your nutrients will go down the drain, which has basically resulted in uh, environmental hazards. So, when we deal with soil fertility, um, this is basically the barrel of yield and nutrients. Of course, when you talk about nutrients, you will have the macronutrients, micronutrients, and all the soil conditioners with other growth factors, right? So, the most important thing that you have to understand that people will always underestimate regarding micronutrients uh, is basically they do not understand the law of the minimum. Okay. The law of the minimum is being um, shared by one of the German scientists back then in the 1800s, 
Okay, so this is the basis of soil fertility where the most limiting amount of nutrients where you can see that on the barrel right there, the yield is going to be limited. So yield is going to be limited by the most limiting amount of nutrients. So now people will always focus on macronutrients, uh, supplying nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium most of the time. And that's the essence of our um, basic fertilizer management, but they forget about micronutrients. So Micronutrients such as iron, copper, zinc, manganese, those are micronutrients, but they are usually being, um, I mean, uh, supplied to the plants is a very limited amount, and usually they can be applied either in, in soil applied application or foliar application. Okay? So, in order for you to maintain okay, the efficiency of the nutrients, you need to be able to work on these four mechanisms right for our nutrient stewardship which has been um, um, I mean mandated by the International Plant Nutrient Institute so you have to look at the right source of fertilizers okay so for example let's say if you want to save costs okay you want to look at the effects of taste of the edible portions of the plants you need to be able to incorporate an element of sulfur for example, okay, to improve the taste, especially in brassica, cabbage, right? So you might want to find fertilizers which has the sulfur-based component, for example, ammonium sulfate. At the same time, you're applying nitrogen in forms of ammonium, and at the same time, you have a two-in-one approach of having sulfur in there, okay? And then the right time of application. So you should be able to know and predict the, I mean, you need to know the weather forecast. For example, do not fertilize right um, before the rainy seasons or after the rainy seasons because of course there will be surface runoff okay and also leaching leaching of nutrients down below the root zone we know that Malaysia we have been blessed by uh, lots of precipitations and right now we know that the distribution pattern is not um, I mean really good right so basically this is why we need to be able to look at the timing of applications and split the fertilizer application instead of once is for one time, so you have to be able to split the amount into different sections. For example, let's say 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare that you need for the growth of entire growth cycle. Uh, maybe two times or three times of split application, so you just apply about 30 kilograms or 35 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So at that, how you manage your fertilizer uh, efficiency. Okay. And then the right rate, right? You need to be able to not go by the book. Of course, when you read reports, it will say flat rate, 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, for example. But that's not the case because when you do soil tests, you will have other residual nutrients in there, in the soil, from the previous cycles of um, growing seasons, right? So basically, what you need to, be, to do is basically to take into account what are the cover crops over there. So let's say if you have cover crops at a particular area, you can actually save at least within the range of 30 to 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare because we know that the cover crops fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, right? And then um, you can maintain the efficiency of the fertilizer at that time when you use the site-specific management approach, right? And then the right place. So placement of fertilizer is also crucial. Uh, of course, you need to be able to know whether it's going to be uh, fertilizer to be applied, whether it's banded or whether it's going to be a pocket. So that will depend on the uh, rooting zone of the plants. Okay? So this is the soil map of Southeast Asia. We know that <coughs> ASEAN, ASEAN uh, will have almost, when you look at the color coding, almost a similar kind of um, soil series because we are living in the uh, I mean uh, tropical climates all right so basically we have the problems of leaching of nutrients due to lots of precipitation so basically what we need is basically a data integration of each of the country so that we will have more traceability transparency in terms of data management so that we can communicate among us okay to do decision making and when you talk about soils, of course, soils will contribute to food security because this is where we, we grow foods, right? 
So basically, um, there will be much more discussion later after during the technical team with the technical people. But I would like to propose over here so that we have an integrated soil fertility management to cover the area of prosperity where you can double the agriculture income, uh, sorry, agriculture productivity and double the farmer's income so that you will have a prosperous community, right? Uh, going for a circular economy approach where you can mitigate the amount of greenhouse gases from waste to wealth, right? And then, of course, partnerships. We need partners to move forward, right? So basically, and another one will be people. So when we do research, right, we need to be able to translate to the community. So we don't want things to be just end up at the top tier journal, but then what's next? So you be, should be able to speak the farmer's language. You should be able to translate your research language into a layman's language so that everybody will have the idea of, okay, what is being applied, right? So, so that the researchers and farmers, they are on the same wavelength, then you get the message. Okay, so uh, dealing with this, when you talk about micronutrients, right, that we are, I mean, usually underestimated over here, uh, dealing with malnutrition problem in the world. So this is a world problem where Southeast Asia is basically at least as a double burden. So we are in the process of, of having a double burden of malnutrition, where there's a lack of iron, zinc, vitamin A in our diets, especially at the edible portion. Being in the developing countries, right, not everybody is accessible to health supplements. So this is where we need to fortify our soils with micronutrients. That is what we call as agronomic biofortification, where you, you supply your soil so that there will be the, the amount of micronutrients in the edible portion is sufficient enough for the children to grow. Okay. So this is one of the projects that we had in Putrajaya for social innovation of how we transform soil fertility in terms of social innovation for the betterment of children with stunted growth. So as you know that in Putrajaya, the baseline is basically, the baseline of stunted growth in Malaysia is about 20%, but Putrajaya has exceeded that up to 24%. So in Malaysia, Kelantan, Trungganu, Pahang, and Putrajaya, they are at the highest malnutrition and stunted growth problem among children. So basically, um, I, would talk, I would like to call upon the, the effectiveness of soil fertility in terms of micronutrient management so that we will, we will have the social innovation, especially to target the, and mitigate the problems, right? So in order for you to get the potential solutions, you need to be able to have active collaborations. So as one of the African proverbs say, if you want to go far, okay, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone. So basically, uh, with, what, with all, all the knowledge that we have, right, we need to serve the community and be able to translate and look below our feet. Right, look below our feet what is basically that we can do and there's so much room for improvement and innovation. Well, thank you. Next up, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ariel Hatano. Um, he is an Associate Professor at Bogo Agriculture University, Indonesia, and he'll be talking about a particularly interesting topic, which is uh, phosphorus status and its availability in agricultural soils in Indonesia. So, um. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the organizer, for having me here. I want to talk about uh, phosphorus status in, and its availability in agricultural soils of Indonesia. As we know that uh, phosphorus is a very essential element. And now, uh, yeah, uh, Indonesia, I think phosphorus is not, the, the, the source of, of phosphorus in Indonesia is not so many, yeah. And uh, we must uh, import from other countries like Russia, yeah. Russia, Belarusia, those countries has uh, how to say, huge amount of uh, rock phosphate, yeah. So, uh, I want to tell you about the phosphorus status, yeah, in Indonesia, okay? Uh, so, before that, 
I want to show you soil reaction. Yeah. We call it soil pH, uh, carbon, uh, phosphorus status in agricultural lands. Yeah. Uh, of course, I, I, I don't show you all of Indonesia. Uh, I just uh, show you for the case studies in, in Lampung, yeah? Lampung, uh, Banten, West Java, yeah? Central Java, and East Java. Uh, those provinces are the, the central, the center of uh, agricultural production. So this is the soil pH, yeah. Uh, yeah, you see here that uh, about yeah, 90 percent, yeah, 90 percent. Uh, I collected about 91 uh, soil samples in Lampung. So the the soil reaction or soil pH in Lampung soils, 95 percent, yeah, uh, have a pH of a below. Of 5.5, yeah. Why I I, I choose 5.5 because in 5.5 pH, uh, aluminium, yeah, as a toxic element, is not detected. Is not detected in the soil analysis. So it is so 5.5. If the soil is oh no, 6.5, 6.5. Okay, 6.5. But 5.5 is much okay actually. Yeah, so 95% of the soil sample in Lampung have a pH of below of 6.5, and 88% uh, of the soil sample in Banten yeah, had a pH of uh, below 6.5. So it it tells us that uh, in in those provinces, uh, soil pH is very is acid. Yes, very acid to every acid to acid. So West Java, not so far from Lampung, yeah. Yeah, I collected 153 soil samples, and 92% of soil samples in West Java have a soil uh, below 6.5. And Central Java, yeah, uh, we go to the eastern part of Indonesia in, in, in Java Island. So 66% of soil sample in Central Java have a soil pH of uh, below 6.5. And different story in East Java. Yeah, in East Java, the soil pH uh, mostly uh, what is it above 6.5. Only 42% of soil samples collected in East Java have a pH. Uh, below 6.5. What about soil organic uh, carbon in, uh, in uh, uh, agricultural land in, in Indonesia? In Lampung, and in Lampung, 75% of soil samples in Lampung have sea organic levels below 2%. Yeah, yeah 2% is a uh, is, um, medium status in the soil. So actually we try to, to make the soil, uh, the, the, the sea organic content of the soil about uh, 2%. And in Banten, 70% of soil sample in Banten have sea organic levels of uh, below 2%. Yeah. In West Java, 70 75%, yeah. So sample in West Java have, or have organic sea levels uh, below 2%. And in Central Java, 82% of soil sample in Central Java have organic sea levels of, uh, below 2%. And East Java, same, yeah, uh, almost same. 80% of soil sample in East Java have sea organic uh, levels uh, below 2%. What about in... Uh, uh, phosphorus, yeah. In Indonesia, we usually we, we use uh, Bre1, Bre1P. Yeah. I, I don't know in Malaysia, maybe uh, uh, we can also use Bre2P. Yeah. But 
usually in Indonesia we analyze uh, available P with uh, uh, Bre1 P. Yeah. So uh, in Lampung, yeah, 80% of soil sample in Lampung have available P below 11 ppm. Yeah. 11 ppm is uh, a medium status yeah, of uh, Bre1 P. Uh, 80%, 85% of soil sample in Banten have available P below 11 uh, ppm. In West Java, yeah, and uh, in West Java, 65% of uh, P uh, of, of, of Bre1 P below 11 ppm. In Central Java. Uh, 56% yeah, below uh, 11 ppm. But in East Java, yeah, only 20% of soil sample in East Java have available P of uh, 11 ppm. So uh, there is a different uh, status in agricultural land of Indonesia for, for phosphorus. So Summary for this this topic: uh, acidic soil in Western Indonesia, yeah, Lampung, Banten, West Java, are huge and need to be conditioned, yeah, to achieve a pH about neutral 6.5. So in general, yeah, in general, soil organic C levels were very low to low at all study case site. Uh, well levels vary variously, yeah, in Lampung, Banten, and East Java. So Efforts to mine P, yeah, to mine P that has accumulated, need to be done to increase uh, fertilization efficiency. So in P distribution, I have experiment in paddy field, yeah, in West Java, Central Java, East Java. Uh, we collected seven locations in West Java, eleven locations in Central Java, five locations in East Java. So. Uh, The, the status, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we also did a section of peer fractionation. So, yeah, and also we did uh, the, the soil analysis affected uh, peer fraction accumulation. So there is, uh, how to say, different in pH, base situation, and uh, FA extracted by the detonate, yeah. So the pest status in paddy field, yeah. Uh, in paddy field, uh, the pest status is very high, yeah, in Indonesia. And then the fractionation, the p fractionation is different, yeah. For instance, in West Java, yeah. Uh, the 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 main fraction is uh, in in AOH p in organic means that uh, it is uh, accumulated in aluminium and iron uh, uh, phosphate, yeah? And then in East Java, uh, accumulated in calcium phosphate. So, so difference, uh, a difference, uh, what is it, a fraction accumulated. So, I, I skip this. So, for somebody in P distribution, soil pH status in Java, PD soil was very high. Yeah. Uh, in West Java, P accumulated in uh, NaOSP and residual P. In Central Java, P accumulated in NaOSP, uh, HCLP, yeah, and residual P. And East Java accumulated in SLP and residual P. So, how to release bandit pea in the soil. So what I did is uh, we use uh, calcium uh, silicate or, uh, or, or sodium silicate, sodium silicate. So silicate can be used for, for substitute pea in the soil, in the soil, in the soil particle. So in this case that the, uh, in this case, that the silicate can be used because the increasing rates of that silicate can increase, can increase uh, availability. 
So this is the percentage. So the summary, uh, this, this one, yeah, uh, silicate is promising to be used as ameliorant for releasing native phosphor in anisole, yeah, in anisole. It's necessary to make a calibration experiment in the field to select which material are good as ameliorant in anisole soil. So conclusion, the nutrient status of agricultural land in Indonesia varies, so that it requires different treatment. Yeah, about 50% P is abundant in available form. Effort to mine phosphorus needs to be done to improve fertilization efficiency. So silicate can be used to mine P. So thank you. Right, thank you, Dr. Arif Hatono, uh, for that uh, presentation on phosphorus availability in Indonesian agricultural soils. Uh, next up, we will have Dr. Well, Professor Dr. Leong Yuan Yung uh, from Sunway University itself, and she will be talking about soil fertility as a productive capital asset. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our food system, especially after the expansion of the barren green deserts of monoculture, fostered by the Green Revolution, contributes to the climate change crisis today. According to the United Nations, agriculture covers nearly 40% of the world's land and is responsible for 17% of the global carbon dioxide emissions. Many decarbonization pathways exist in the agriculture sector. To find a sustainable system solutions, we need to look deeper. Our research in Cambridge in 2005 demonstrated that it is the quality of relationships that make things work. This requires acknowledging our relationship, not simply with nature, but within nature, and to work on understanding and honouring the, the relationships within ecosystems, including human ecosystems. Caring enables growth. Caring is the action, and growth is the result. This principle is brilliantly demonstrated in the work of Gawat Kalinga, Enchanted Farm in the Philippines. In the GK Enchanted Farms, communities are mobilized to transform barren and waste land into fertile soil that produces food sustainably. This has empowered poverty-stricken Filipinos to be self-sustaining farmers and to live with dignity. The 12th Malaysia Plan identifies soil fertility to be a health indicator of this ecosystem that must be closely monitored and recommends more soil testing to be done in collaboration with universities. The 12th Malaysia Plan should have also pinpointed soil fertility as a lever for agriculture productivity and decarbonization. The excessive use of fertilizer seriously damages the microbiological ecosystem that is the soil's fertility. It is a vicious cycle that makes the agricultural system even more dependent on fertilizer and pesticide, which have been increasing in prices. What is needed is a biological solution based on a thorough understanding on the underlying microbiological ecosystem and working to regenerate it. Microbes prepare the nutrients in a form that could be absorbed by a plant. Science-based composting and other soil fertility and reaching practices will promote rather than ravage biodiversity in the soil and on farms and thus increase agricultural productivity, which impacts food security and farmers' incomes. 
More than that, these good farming practices will also improve carbon sequestration, water efficiency, national health, and reduce farmers' indebtedness and suicides. Despite its dirt-like appearance, soil is a living entity, and that is the ultimate basis of all human, plant, and animal life. We need to preserve the health of the soil in the same way that we are nurturing the health of life below water, SDG 14, and life on land, SDG 15. Life in soil is largely microbial and should be designated as SDG 18. Soil is not only the largest reservoir of microbial diversity on Earth, but also the largest terrestrial water reservoir. Soil stores two-thirds of all fresh waters, and with water as the medium, soil acts as a bioreactor that circulates the essential elements of living matter, recycles waste, and purifies water. Water in the soil functions like blood in the human body. Planet Earth is facing a crisis of soil deterioration as a result of human abuses. Desertification and erosion have diminished the quality of soil services, for example, producing food to feed the human population and sequestering carbon to regulate global temperature. Vibrancy never occurs in only one part of an ecosystem. Either the whole ecosystem is vibrant or vibrancy is not there. Vibrancy is the flow of life, what the Chinese would call qi. Since soil is a living being, it needs to be fed. Microbes in the soil require carbon to build energy for development and nitrogen to build proteins. Plantation crops continuously absorb soil nutrients in order to grow. Feeding the soil with chemical fertilizers Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, does not replenish all the lost nutrients. Soil in intensive agriculture system loses carbon when material, plant material is removed from the land during harvest. Carbon starvation can happen to the soil when soil organic matter is not replenished. After a considerable period, organic matter in the soil will break down, causing nutrients to be washed away by rain. Then, low soil fertility and low crop productivity sets in. Replenishing this organic matter with compost returns to the soil the nutrients, NPK and the micronutrients, and organic matter, meaning the carbon, taken away with harvest. As the nutrient content and quality of the soil improve, the growth of plant roots underground and crops above ground increases, leading to more carbon absorption from the atmosphere. Animals used to be part of farmlands, and their manure is a food source for microbes. However, the arrival of farm machineries have moved society in the direction of animal-free agriculture. Besides food, microbes need appropriate housing, meaning well-aggregated soil, to thrive. An aggressively tilled soil breaks soil pores and aggregates apart. And when land is ploughed up to 9 to 12 inches in depth with tractors and machines and left open, biodiversity is seriously destroyed. Besides understanding soil in a scientific and technical sense, we need to build an intimate and loving relationship with it, meaning to understand it in a relational sense, not in an abstract academic sense, to get that shared vibrancy. When people who work with the soil and live with it but do not see it as something to have a relationship with, meaning that they don't love the soil, then there is a big problem. Composting happens at ambient temperature and atmospheric pressure. Thus, it is more efficient than the energy-hungry Haber-Bosch process which converts hydrogen and nitrogen to ammonia at temperatures around 500 degrees Celsius 
and at pressures up to 20 megapascal. The Haber-Bosch process consumes about 1% of the world's total energy production and has only 50% energy efficiency. The carbon footprint of ammonia synthesis is accentuated by the use of natural gas to generate the hydrogen needed for making ammonia. 75 to 90% of ammonia produced globally is directed to fertilizer production, which supports nearly half of global food production. Half of the nitrogen from synthetic fertilizers ends up polluting the environment. Instead of waiting for nitrogen fertilizer production to decarbonize with the emergence of green ammonia, farmers and policymakers can shift their mindset to treat soil as a living being and feed it appropriately so that the symbiotic relationships between microbes and plants can always be vibrant. Storing soils in uh, storing carbon in soils as a measure to mitigate change is gaining momentum. For example, the 4 per 1,000 initiative launched by the French government at COP21 Paris Climate Summit in 2015. Increasing soil organic carbon by just 0.4% annually would increase global production of major food crops by 20 to 40% per year and lead to an additional one gigaton of carbon being sequestered per year on average. There are also carbon, farm, carbon farming practices under the Common Agricultural Policy and other EU programs such as Life and Horizon Europe, in particular under the mission A Soil Deal for Europe. Land improvement, soil conservation, agriculture, agriculture loans and rehabilitation of land are under the state's care. Only with a change in mindset will policy makers make reducing fertilizer subsidies and increasing funding to agriculture investments that nurture soil as a productive capital asset and develop good farming practice. Plantation companies are unable to transform their relationship with the soil everywhere at once. What they can usefully do is focus on the nurseries that grow new seedlings and the planting out of new seedlings, in particular when replanting old plantations. A soil fertility action plan will have the following strategic components. Number one, change the mindset and regenerate the attitude towards soil and re the human relationship with it. Number two, develop the science and understanding of the whole soil ecosystem. For example, how to identify in detail and measure the microbial life in the soil that is its fertility. Develop and manage a global database that shares this information globally and give information and advisory service to smallholders and others wherever they are. Number three, to rejuvenate the soil and the farms. Number four, to level up the human skills and managerial approach as a coherent integrated strategic policy for the future. Rehabilitation of soil ecosystems at a massive scale is possible and makes financial sense. Not only will it improve employment, incomes and income resilience for ordinary people, it will also ensure that the diverse functions of soil will be fully available to future generations. Thank you, and back to you, Jinan. Thank you, Dr. Leong. Um, next up, we have Dr. Gusti Anchari, um, Professor at the Soil Science Department, Magister of the Environmental Studies uh, uh, Division, Tanjung Pura University, Indonesia. And he will be speaking on the topic of changes in bacterial community composition which reviews the anthropogenic disturbances on tropical peat. So, Dr. Anchari, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chen. Uh, this is my honor to be here to present this uh, small uh, work. So, my name is Gusti Anchari. My, my title uh, presentation is Changing in bacterial community uh, composition 
reveal anthropogenic disturbances on tropical pits. So I would like also to thank you, my our co-author here, Nisan Lovita, Epi, Pajar, Chico, Rasis, and also Felin. So I'm from the Newport University, and uh, my group also from uh, the uh, what they call it, Yayasan Conservasi Alam Nusantara or uh, the, Na the Nature Conservancy of Indonesia. Okay. So as I'm happy to hear Duli Professor Yuan about the changes of the land use that disturb the soil in this case the tropical pit land. We know uh, the ready tropical peatland has become a carbon source. It's widely known now. It's acceptable, but we don't know the phenomenon. This, we know we know the phenomenon, but we don't know the process and the mechanism how the carbon is released from this uh, tropical peatland. Because only a few studies are presently published in literature are looking at uh, soil microbiome, either bacteria or archaea, also. Uh, the fungus or the fungi. Okay, so in small st this, this is the first study. Uh, just aim to compare the composition of microbial communities, in particular bacteria and archaea, in this tropical peat used for smallholder agriculture, oil farm plantation is very big business in Southeast Asia, and also in uh, the remaining secondary peat forests yeah, in uh, uh, this region. Yeah. So this is study site. Uh, I'm from West Kalimantan, really the equatorial line. Uh, we have uh, what we call it, the red pattern is an equatorial system. No clear distinction between rainy and uh, dry seasons. All year is just humid and wet. We have about maybe 200 on average, 300 millimeter per month of rain and annual rainfall can be 300. 3,000 uh, millimeter, and temperature is very warm and hot, yeah, and humid, yeah. So we collect this sample from three land uses on Finland, smallholder agriculture, oil palm, and uh, secondary forest. So we collected data in August uh, last year, okay. We made two transect, uh, drain and reweighted transect, because in, you know in Indonesia, uh, since 2016, the peat land must be restored by hydrology. The government built the, what they call it, canal blockage in order to increase the groundwater table. Okay, uh, so we uh, sample code here, secondary forest. We get a drain and also the uh, reweighted secondary forest, SFD and SFR, drain oil palm and reweighted oil palm, OP and drain agriculture, RRD, and RRR, the related agriculture. We collected 12 sample core, sample core using uh, the Russian peat auger, and then we sent to uh, Norfolk in Singapore for the NR analysis, but we do it replicates, it become 24 sample in total, yeah. Okay, it's a long process, yeah. And we come to the result, yeah, so, we have a lot of uh, more than uh, million, uh, three, three million operational taxonomy units. Yeah, DNA is DNA. So many, uh, most of them about uh, two million point eight are unknown or others. Yeah, it's not identified at a level of species. Yeah, but we uh, have the phyla. Yeah, so you can see the this the relative dominance of the phyla. So the majority, the dominant phyla is what we call it. Proteobacteria, Permicute, Actinobacteriota, and Bacterio, uh, Bacteroidota. Yeah. This is the, uh, the top four pillar, about 87%. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then biodiversity indices, like Professor Yuan already mentioned, is very high. Yeah. A lot of uh, soil microbes in the, in the pit, in the pit soil. Pit soil is very acid. Yeah. A lot of acid than the mineral soil. Uh, Dr. Ari just mentioned, yeah, there were pH, yeah, three or four only here, yeah, very acid. So, but a lot of uh, living organism in this uh, peatland uh, soil, yeah. Okay, uh, this is because a lot of uh, species, uh, hundreds of them, so we, we try to combine them uh, 
into, of course, we, some are unidentified, and we call it this, uh, one is regiospere, or as a plant uh, growth promoting regiospere bacteria, PGPR, and some are as a human pathogen, uh, others we don't know, and also organic compound uh, degrader, they just, like the Professor Yuan said, they depends on the carbon, the organic carbon. And we have also, uh, interestingly, we find it uh, gut bacteria in human and animals. And also we have uh, bacteria can might use as a biopesticide. And bacteria play significant role in biochemical cycle like nitrogen or carbon or sulfur or iron. Yeah. And also we have uh, antimicrobial uh, resi resistant that may produce antibiotics or resistant to uh, 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 heavy metals, for example, and also have a mic mic microbial agent as or produce other enzymes. Yeah. Okay. So this can see that uh, we have uh, important here, the gut bacteria is very high in the uh, blue color, yeah, in this relative uh, prominence and some biochemical cycle also in the gray color and also the uh, biochemical uh, degraders yeah, here. Okay, and then let's get this uh, heat map. Yeah, you can see there in the top uh, here, the gut bacteria is very prominent in uh, drain agriculture in related uh, oil palm here, yeah. okay. And in the bottom, you can see uh, the prominent bacteria occur in the, as a biochemical cycle and organic uh, compound together in uh, agriculture, related agriculture, related secondary forest, drain oil palm, and drain secondary forest. Maybe you, <laughs> uh, because our secondary forest is not uh, pristine, it's disturbed. There is a canal, a drainage canal. So we have uh, uh, drain uh, secondary forest here. Yeah. So also drain canal is newly uh, built, yeah. Uh, 2020, I think, the government built it, yeah. And also we have, uh, uh, importantly, the, uh, uh, what we call it, uh, yeah, human pathogen also occur in the secondary forest of the bacteria. When, uh, this is my new study. In the past, when I was, yeah, back 20 years ago, you know, uh, I live in the uh, did a lot of transect in the tropical forest, li uh, stay there, applying camp, yeah, sub, uh, up, up to a month in, in the forest. So we just drink the water of this uh, peatland, okay? Because, so at the time we didn't care what is, a lot of bacteria, is, <laughs> yeah. It's not healthy at all, yeah. At the time we, did, we, did, we just drink the water there, yeah. Naturally, okay. So, come on discussion and conclusion. So, let's see from this small study, who can, human activities and an aerobic, an anaerobic or waterlogged environment, yeah, in this pit, yeah, even the drain one, support the deployment of gut bacteria in this study, yeah, this case study. And some of gut bacteria may be uh, benefits to human, like probiotics. But others might cause some uh, human disorders, yeah, related to, it's very complex, yeah. And drug, uh, importantly, the graded pit would become a host of, uh, for, for developing a gut bacteria that might threaten human, human health, yeah. In addition, the carbon loss uh, or biodiversity loss. This is a new uh, perspective, maybe. So, but we need, to have offer the studies, the linkage of the human disturbance on tropical pit, yeah, uh, bacteria, uh, the bacteria composition changes with the human health. Yeah. So it's very uh, maybe important yeah, to look at it for the future, relative uh, in relation to the sustainability uh, here. So it's not that easy, but this is a uh, maybe important issue to be uh, to be a concern. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, the last slide I have. I have to, I know it's, uh, thank you for SSN support me to, to be here. And this research was funded by Bezos, yeah, Earth, uh, Earth Fund. And this paper is under review at, uh, on the, by Applied Soil Ecology Journal, yeah. 
still under review. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anshari. So, last but not least, I'd like to invite Dr. Budi Sulistiwadi. I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, Assistant Professor, Centre of Geospatial Information Infrastructure Development, uh, part of the Institute for Research and Community Services, Mula Waman University, Indonesia. And the topic will be on remote sensing for soil. All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted that I'm standing up here uh, by the invitation for the from the Sustainable uh, Development Support Network. Uh, yeah, f especially for this soil uh, session. Um, yeah, maybe different with uh, the first five presenters that um, most of them are talking about everything on the ground. I'm gonna bring you up to the satellites on space, on the drones, to see everything from above, yeah. So uh, the slide is quite large, so I may skip some because of the time constraint. So I'm so sorry before uh, if, if some of the slides may be important for you. <coughs> Just a little bit introduce, introduction about myself. Yeah, uh, I've already been introduced before. Um, I'm working in, in Mulawarman University. Uh, but used to work in some other institutions, including uh, NASA in the Goddard Space Flight Center back in 2013. Um, there are five parts of this talk, but may, I may skip the details on number two and number three because it's maybe too technical and the time constraints as well. So uh, we'll dig more about the application of remote sensing more on the soil and land uh, applications. Back to the definitions, what is the remote sensing? So basically, uh, we put our eyes on Earth, on space, uh, through the satellites, through the airborne um, platforms, and then we can see everything what hap everything happens on our Earth. <clears throat> there are different uh, level of plat platforms that we can use, including those on the land. So uh, land remote sensing is also part, uh, important part of the remote sensing techniques. Uh, apart from those in uh, airs and, 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 on, and on space. And we also know that there are two uh, main uh, remote sensing systems. The first one is the passive remote sensing, where the sensors only receive the signals as it reflected or uh, transmitted directly from the Earth. And the active sensors, where the platforms also transmit something and then receive back the uh, return signal. Um, there are a lot of interactions between these uh, signals on the atmospheres and as well as the uh, on the ground. So um, remote sensing is uh, fast of uh, information and um, knowledge that you want to learn about it. And we also um, limited by the spectrum that our eyes can uh, identify. So if you see the rainbows in the middle, then that's uh, the only uh, range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. The others, we cannot see, but we can sense it. So through the uh, numbers uh, reflected from the objects, we can uh, sense many other things. Now, this is the slide that I want to bring to up uh, to you, bring up to you, that um, this is the race of the Earth's observation satellite systems in the world. <laughs> Uh, part of them are India, they are quite uh, advanced in this. USA, of course, they have hundreds of them. Uh, European Union, they have also hundreds and trying to catch up with the US. And also China. China is also leading sectors in this business. The question is, is Asian ready? Is Asian ready as a multi-country uh, mission? That's the question for us in the end of this presentation. So, uh, in passive remote sensing, as I mentioned before, uh, we receive the signals as reflected from the ground. And from this aerial photography and photogrammetry, we put them in the small scale. So, um, we limited uh, the areas with the uh, coverage of the camera. And then, on the optical satellite missions uh, sense, as I mentioned before, we uh, limited with the electromagnetic spectrum that we can sense. But still, uh, there are quite... Um, 
uh, fast race on the providing provision of the information from the satellites through the, the optical systems. How does it appear on the color, color image? As a color image, so because of the uh, nature of the data, which is uh, contains of the strength of the signals, we can translate it into colors that our eyes can detect. Then we can understand what happened in the in on the Earth, as we can see in this image. When we translate the first uh, band into blue color, then our eyes can sense it as blue. And then when we combine them with the green and the red, we can see the color composite on the right side. We also talk about radiometric resolutions, how, uh, how is the differentiation between the tones of the uh, colors that we can see, as well as the spatial resolutions. Of course, when the pixel size is getting smaller, then we can see much more than uh, what we can see in the uh, coarser uh, scale. As of the temporal, uh, we can also set up the satellite to come back in several uh, days or even two times a day uh, for some satellites, depends on our needs. Um, one other application of the remote sensing is the hyperspectral remote sensing. This is the most complex one because it consists of so many bands, so many different channels that we need to analyze. But it's very useful also to deal with uh, bare soil or bare land. Because as you can see in this image, um, there are a lot of uh, spectrum that we need to uh, differentiate. But then at the end, we can uh, understand what kind of uh, chemical substance in the soil or on the rock. Um, now we come to the trends in the UAV or drones. It's very famous right now. Everyone can buy it as cheap as 200 ringgits, probably. So um, it's become very, very popular and very useful and powerful right now. As you can see in the, in the left image, uh, there are very mu uh, so many different uh, platforms or size of the drones. And the right, si right hand side image show us uh, how is this business growing up so fast. And it's also supported by the easy uh, or easiest um, processing work workflows, as you can see in the image. With the several clicks, you already got your image that you need. Okay, I need I need to fast uh, get it faster now. Now the active remote sensing is quite different because um, it sends the signals that's uh, sent out by the sensors itself. And as you can see here, uh, how to interpret the image is much different. But the the type of the information is also different because the active remote sensing can sense the dielectric, dielectric constant of the soil that, uh, that can help us with uh, the condition of the soil moisture, for example. And the LiDAR is also part of the uh, active remote sensing that can sense uh, topography in very detail. I'll skip this. Now we come to this business about the forest and climate that uh, satellites can sense so many things, including the condition of the atmosphere, condition of the land, as well as the condition of the bare land without the um, vegetation on top of it. This is one example in East Kalimantan, the province uh, where we got the funding for, uh, for defending our forests. So the, the basis is like this, that we sense the land cover uh, from time to time and then we claim how, many, how much carbon that we retain in our forests. And also that uh, part of this uh, greenhouse gas inventory. Now, in this image, you can see on the left hand, left hand side, there is a list about uh, two or three dozens of uh, uh, sensors of mis or missions uh, devoted only for water cycle, for example. And then for land surface, hydrology, we can also sense some of the uh, characteristic of the land. And this um, slide shows you uh, how we do uh, measurements on the mangrove forest using the drones and the terrestrial laser scanners that we install on the ground. This is the result from the terrestrial laser scanner, so we can see that much of details of the biomass. And we can see the difference between the uh, ground measurements. Now, about the soil, we have at least 13 missions that can help us to characterize our soil. But still, this is still not all characters, characteristic of soil that we can sense. So most of them using the rad, uh, microwave radiometer, which, um, which has very coarse resolution, 
So you can see in the next slides how, how coarse are they. And then, uh, of course, um, some sensors that can somehow describe the soil moisture. I said somehow because it's not direct observation still. It still needs some other observation to mix up. So this is the first slide about the soil moisture. So this business is not a new one. This paper comes from 1976, right the year when I was born. <laughs> so it's 40 years old, science. And still, until today, people still struggle with that because it's, it cannot be uh, observed directly from the space or from the air. As you can see here, the resolution is so coarse, so uh, it's very, very difficult to get the um, detailed uh, information on the soil moisture, even with the latest sensors. This is the global uh, pictures of the soil moistures, as other uh, researchers done. Uh, and this is the compari comp comparison, com comparison between the remote sensing and the ground measurements. As you can see, uh, they are close together. And then this is how difficult the sensors cover the whole world, because sometimes the orbits and then the uh, characteristic of the platforms uh, does not allow us to observe the, the whole world at the same time. Another example is the soil salinity that can be also inferred with others with the help of other ancillary uh, geospatial data. So basically, we need to mix uh, many other data to come up with uh, some soil characteristic characteristics. And these slides uh, they describe the soil degradation as uh, described by with the uh, soil erosion, and then also uh, some of the soil uh, salinity on some part of this uh, research uh, location. Now, the other part is the soil organic carbon. Uh, there is a chance to sense that with the help of many other data, as I said before, but still uh, it cannot be directly measured from the space, either from the air. So in summary, what kind of uh, characteristic that we can directly observe, or at least uh, with some little help, First of all, of course, we can measure the land cover and above, above ground, got biomass. It's also, it's, uh, of course, it's feasible. And then soil moisture with the help of some other data, soil salinity, and of course, the soil temperature from the brightness temperature features of the remote sensing data. What are uh, characteristics that we still cannot direct op directly observe? Soil fertility, soil organic, car organic carbon, physical characteristics, and as well as soil type. We still need to go to the ground to know uh, the soil type. So this is the last slide, which is more, most important. Uh, more in-depth research are needed to understand how remote sensing can be used to effectively describe the current condition of our soil. And then various methods need to be exercised and so to support very detailed image, obta image obtained from the UAV or drone or many other uh, high resolution data. And the last but the important one is the multi-country satellite mission specifically built for identifying soil characteristic are both opportunity, opportunity and challenge. Because as discussed before, there are a lot of uh, needs, there are a lot of uh, um, interests between countries. So uh, that concludes my uh, talk today. And thank you very much for your attention and I'm very open for question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sulistio Adi. So now we come to what I consider usually the more interesting part of the talk, which is or the, the workshop, which is the question and answer session. Can I just check whether there's a mic going on, uh, going around? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, are there any questions from the audience first before I start with my list of questions? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Minhas Farid Ahmed. I'm from University Gawangsang, Malaysia. Uh, my question, uh, uh, the presenter presented on remote sensing, also the peatland. So earlier in the presentation, uh, we we seen peatland is the main, one of the main sources of frequent forest fires. So when I see uh, uh, presenting that soil moisture can be detected based on satellite. So how effective to measure this uh, peatland weighted 
or dry uh, through the remote sensing or GIS application? Or is there any policy to maintain uh, the pitland uh, in wet condition anywhere in the world? Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, the remote sensing in terms of can it detect how wet the soil is yeah. to prevent fires? Um, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I'll answer about the possibilities for remote sensing first. So first of all, as I mentioned before, the, the constraining factors is still the resolution because the soil moistures indeed can be sensed uh, through the remote sensors, either from the air or from the space. But the problem is the resolutions of the soil moisture missions right now is still very, very limited. So the, the smallest pixel that it can produce is varies from one to five kilometers. So that's the problem because uh, it, it still needs to be con combined with other sensors and some other um, algorithms behind it. So with that kind of resolutions, we can tell if the peatland is quite large. So when it's uh, small, then it's quite difficult. Other, uh, other approach that you can do that I didn't present, I'm sorry about that, is through the, the, the gravity. So there are some gravity missions such as GRACE, G-R-A-C-E, or um, GOCE, G-O-C-E, from the European Union. Uh, both are sensing the, the difference uh, of the gravity fields and they sense the difference between gravity fields from the water and from the uh, pure soil. So people can see. But again, the resolution is even coarser. It's five kilometers or more. <laughs> so that's answering the first part of the question. So the second one maybe Ibu Luli. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, what happened is that, yes, he's doing the te technology to, to... But in terms of um, prevention of peatland on fire, it's not about wet. Uh, wet is not the real answer, actually. It's about the soil moisture. There's a difference between moist and wet. So using the remote sensing, you can measure the mo uh, moisture or the wetness, but you cannot detect the, the top layer. What is most important is the 20 centimeter above the water table. So the 20 centimeter above the water table is the porosity of the soil. So if the soil is porous, the bulk density is low, no matter even if your water table is 20 centimeter, you will still have a chances of pit fire. But if your soil is moist with the top layer being high bulk density, and even if the water table goes down to about 60 to 70 centimeters, you will not have pit fire because there is enough capillary rise to, uh, go, uh, for the water to move from the water table up to the soil surface. So that is the real issue that is still uh, being, uh, not being properly clarified uh, globally. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any follow-up questions to that from the audience? If not, because I have a follow-up question for uh, Dr. Mailing. Um, and my question is, given the fact that we are clearing peat soil at a rapid pace, um, one of the things that we take for granted in the tropical rainforest is that if we leave a piece of land alone for long enough, it will turn back into a forest. Yes, it's secondary forest, but it will still be a forest. Is that the same for peat lands? If yes. you leave it long enough. Yeah. That is a very interesting question because there's a lot of misunderstanding the, between the difference between uh, temperate soil and tropical soil in terms of fertility. So what happens is that in, in the temperate soil, the soil fertility is in the soil. But in the tropical soil, the soil fertility are in the trees. So that is number one. Number two, in terms of the characteristics between uh, tropical soil uh, mineral and peat, the fertility of the soil is ten times lower for um, a peat soil compared to uh, mineral soil. So when, when the land is cleared, it was my fear. My fear why I ran for my life to make sure that the peat will not become savanna. Because once you clear this peat swamp forest, and if there is no uh, management on how it should be developed, you are turning a tropical peat swamp forest into a savanna, which is what is being called belukar in Indonesia. Now, a lot of this has been abandoned because of uh, insufficient understanding about the peat soil. Now, when the condition of the peat is in a blue car format, the regrowth is even 10 times lower than a typical mineral soil of a tropical soil. 
And with that sort of uh, condition, the soil porosity is high, the probability of the chances of this abandoned peatland or abandoned uh, or the waiting for the regrowth, the probability of the pit fire is very high. And I believe currently in Indonesia, there is a struggle to rehabilitate about 2 million hectares of uh, abandoned peatland. You have abandoned sago areas because of the uh, insufficient understanding on how to develop it. And who is going to finance? Because yes, there is this word called rewet, but rewet is an imagination. And uh, there is a fashion show. There's a word called. They even create the word called peludi culture, rewet. But please, if you really fully understand how the trees in natural condition grows, how it develop in the tropical peat swamp forest. It, it, this phenomenon is not feasible. Yeah. So it is important to know that the seedlings of the tropical peat swamp trees do not grow on wet condition, but actually at the root mat of the uh, drier part of the peat swamp forest. So with that sort of understanding, we need to try and fine tune how would you do it on a new generated, uh, I mean on a rehabilitation area. So this is the gap of knowledge which we need to embark into future studies. Thank you. All right, thank you. My name is Sai Razlan. I'm retired, uh, but still performing as a farmer. Mm. Okay, and uh, I'd like to go back to the basics. Okay, we are talking every day about food security, food safety, and we are also. But it involves soil. Let's go back to the basics, and that is, let's get the children, let's get the people who are planting to know what the soil is, as what uh, Prof. Uh, Yuan uh, Leong says, okay? Now, our extension education, extension services must get its act together. Sometimes, because it doesn't affect you, you couldn't care less. And that goes the same with the uh, erosion of the uh, sea, coastal areas. Coastal areas yeah. It doesn't affect you because your house is not there. But if your house is there, you are very worried. Now, I'm very worried about the future of Malaysia, the future of the world. When we talk about food security, we need to have food. And food, somehow or other, revolves around soil. The chicken needs corn. The corn needs to be planted. And if you go on planting, you got to go big scale. And if you go big scale, you need machineries. When you need machineries, we talk about the pit soil. The pit soil also, there are various types of pit soil. Some of the machineries cannot even go in. It's a waste. I've worked a lot on the soil, okay? And I use microbes. Um, the young lady from Sarawak, I say young lady because I think you're still working, right? I'm not. Okay. Uh, now, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that maybe we should understand that there should be enough research being done on or focus towards giving grants towards the research on peat using microbes for peat. The microbes could turn the peat into something more valuable. I've worked on microbes. Okay, I've made people, some of the farmers double their yield, but there's also the negative side of it, I must say. When they become rich, they add on new properties. The farmers, they, one of them even married another one. Okay, but those are the life of things, okay? What we need them is to be self-sustaining and we should sustain our quality of soil understanding, get the schools to get involved in it. The picture, somebody showed the picture about the children uh, working on the soil. Let them get used to it. Now I see students, students are scared of about holding soil. Let's face it, this is life. Okay, it's just a comment which I feel that the government have got to, all, all government have got to look into seriousness of the soil and to improve them. Thank you.
All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would open the question uh, to uh, Prof. Leong, uh, but I have been informed that we are running short of time, although um, we, know we have a lot of questions actually to go through. Unfortunately, I think that we have to wait for another day. I do apologize. Oh, uh, sure, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Don't worry, you can, uh, the rich one can have more wives and the uh, rich men, uh, rich ladies can have more husbands, no issue. Uh, yes, I agree with you uh, because a lot of times people treat that soil is dirt, you know. So, uh, but I think this all starts from us. As we point one finger to everybody, we should also look at the three fingers about us. So, charity starts from home. There's a word that says it also starts from we ourselves. We start it from home with our children, you know. So then, then we go to the schools, but uh, it is very important because I know that a lot of times people have this hydroponic or whatever uh, way you do the uh, agriculture, but actually you are just eating volume. Volume, but not the nutrient content. So nutrient content is not enough. You know? So a lot of us here are alive, you know, here, but are we fully functional? And all that boils to how we manage the fertility of the soil. Because the fertility of the soil determines the, vi the vibration of the human uh, on above the above ground. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Ming, yeah, I have to stop uh, you there. But thank you very much for the comment. And I do sincerely apologize to the rest of the panel uh, because of the lack of time. Um, we will have this hopefully again, maybe next year. But uh, I wish you all the best and thank you for your time. We, we, we really appreciate it from Sunway University. Right. Um, thank you all. Can you give us a round of applause?